Hello everybody, I'm Alexander Hakopian and I'm going to be presenting my capstone thesis on hybrid engine, hybrid rocket engine optimization through open control techniques. So firstly let's discuss the three main types of rocket engines. They are solid rocket motors, liquid rocket engines, and hybrid rocket engines. The main difference in these names is actually self-explanatory. So, solid rocket motors utilize solid phase fuel and oxidizer. Liquid rocket engines utilize liquid phase fuel and oxidizer, and hybrids are a mix of the two, often utilizing solid phase fuel and liquid oxidizer, while other configuration also exists. The hybrid rocket engines will be the focus of my work that I'll be discussing next. Looking at the advantages and disadvantages of these models, we can see that SRMs, or solid rocket motors, are very high in thrust, offer high thrust, are very simplistic in nature, are the cheapest to manufacture, and have long storage stability. However, they are not throttleable, which is why they're mostly used as rocket boosters on larger rockets, and have very low specific impulse because, inefficient, because of inefficient combustion. Uh, LREs are the most expensive, most complex, but also offer the highest specific impulse or efficiency, and high thrust and throttleability. The cost and complexity is the main issue with them, uh, and as well as the fact that they have to utilize a larger volume of fuel to operate. Hybrids actually are in the middle ground between the two. Uh, taking the advantages of the simplicity from the uh, solid rocket motor side and the uh, having a cost that's less than the LREs, as well as the ability to throttle, is one of their advantages. The disadvantages and the focus of my study, however, was the propellant ratio shifts during operation, which are caused by the regression of the fuel. Wow. Um, so looking at the hybrid structure, we can notice the solid fuel casing inside, uh, as well as the cross-sectional area of the fuel grain. During operation, the solid fuel grain would expand, causing the burn area to enlarge, which itself would uh, induce a lot of fuel particles released at unit time as compared to the oxidizer. Because of that, we can get uh, inefficient ratios that are, because there is a stoichiometric ratio which, need, which needs to be held to have complete combustion. In this case, we might have some shifts of that ratio causing inefficient combustion, which in effect lowers the specific impulse or efficiency of the engine. So the motivation of this study and research was to control the oxidizer valve of the engine uh, eliminate the OF ratio shifts, which uh, result the inefficiencies, and try to increase the overall efficiency of the engine as well as the thrust. Now let's like, take a look into some background that was needed to perform all of this. Firstly, we can see we can get our uh, thrust equations for our rockets, uh, and because we're working with an ideal case, and mostly rockets are designed to be ideal at the range where they're operated, we considered uh, the pressures to be the same and an ideal nozzle to be present, just both for simplistic calculations and as well as uh, actual designs work like that. We can also use the formula we just derived and integrated through time to get the total impulse, which will be the measure of our efficiency. Moving forward, modeling the mass flow rate summation and uh, the OF ratio, we can also take into a look the effect I mentioned earlier, which was the fuel regression that's causing all of the inefficiencies. The regression area is modeled by the, by the following formula you see there, which we can see is uh, proportional to the inverse square of the radius, uh, of the initial radius of the fuel grain. Uh, from this, we can also derive the mass flow rate and relate it to the radius, which will, after some uh, integration processes of the regression equation would allow us to finally reach the mass flow rate history function, which allows us to simulate the change in mass flow rate of the fuel throughout time for any specific given fuel type with the regression coefficients, as well as the engine parameters. Coming to the engine parameters, for this research, the Hydra 3X student built uh, engine parameters were used to perform all the calculations as well as 14 different fuels with their given experimentally found uh, regression rate coefficients and flux exponents were used for the simulation. Did you say students made, this, made these engines? Yes, yes. Okay, we'll make sure. All right. So moving into the work that was actually done. Uh, because we found out that the OF ratio was the oxidizer flow rate uh, proportional over, over mass flow rate of the fuel, 
in, in order to keep that stable, we, we want to control the oxidizer in the same manner that the fuel is being changed. For that, plugging in the, the oxidizer equation allows us to receive the control function that the uh, oxidizer uh, mass flow rate valve needs to follow in order to achieve what we have. From, uh, from experimenting with this function, it, was, uh, it, it occurred <coughs> that it was too complex to be solved analytically. Therefore, it had to be numerically approximated using MATLAB. Um, so you can see that the, we used VPA solve software and we approximated the uh, mass what we now call the theoretical mass flow rate function, uh, which is what it has to follow. And it is simulated for all the different fuel types, which are all the different lines you can see on the graph. So we know that the controller must follow these functions, and we also know that we need an analytical form if we want to have a digital controller that's going to do this. So in order to have that, we need to approximate the theoretical control function, or TCF, uh, which we have done a couple of approximations of. I'll show the two most viable ones next. So firstly, we decided to do a power approximation since the mass flow rate itself was proportional to 1 over T. Um, the fitting was done in the for following um, proportionalities of the coefficient and exponent were found, yielding the, what we call the power control function, where A is the regression rate coefficient of the fuel and N is the flux exponent. Plotting this graph results in an average R squared of 0 0.9927, which is not bad at all. And we can see the similar behavior uh, with the uh, theoretical control function. However, one significant problem is that we now have problematic vertical asymptotes at t equals zero seconds. This would result in infinite values of oxidizer, which the computer would not be able to handle and are physically impossible. For this reason, uh, we decided to recalculate the theoretical control function while keeping one of the variables stable and varying the, the other and vice versa. This would allow us to find better correlations between the variables in our next video. This is uh, flux exponent varied, uh, regression rate kept constant. And this is the, the, the reverse. So we keep the re flux exponent constant and vary the regression rate. Using the recalculated theoretical control function graphs, we're able to perform the Bellevadec approximation uh, using Origin Pro, which yielded us in the following coefficients uh, for each of the fuels, which were then fitted using MATLAB to the regression rate coefficient and the flux exponent, resulting in the following proportionalities. Yes. This is all one direction. There's no feedback. No, this is an open loop controller. I'll be coming to that in, in a second. Uh, yielding the, the, the last, the, the final form of the, what we call the Bellevadec control function. While plotting the Bellevadec control function, we can see uh, almost identical behavior to the theoretical control function. We have very high R squares. For N, it's 100% correlation. And for the A average is 0 0.998. Uh, it's an overall better fit for the numerical approximations, and we have resolved the issues of the infinities as uh, per the equation at t equals zero, we no longer have infinite values. Since this is going to be working on a rocket engine and it has to be ignited in a way, we also want to simulate the opening of a valve. And this was done using the general squ uh, square root formula. Uh, with the same coefficients that were found in the, uh, in the Benerhadek approximation to match the slopes. And we can use the following function to calculate the uh, intersection points in time for each fuel where, the, where we simulate the valve and then start controlling um, valve opening and then start controlling the valve after. So plugging everything back into the original equations we used from literature, we can find the uh, thrust, simulate, thrust equation which we're going to use to simulate everything. And we can see from the thrust equation that we actually need an oxidizer input. So for a no control case, oxidizer input would include the uh, valve simulation and then constant values for every fuel. This would look something like that. And without control, we result in the following uh, thrust simulations for every fuel. We can see the thrust simulations above and the oxidizer, operational oxidizer to fuel ratio shifts below. As we can see, we notice the effect of the shifts uh, throughout operation with no control case. For this, we designed something called the Prometheus Open Loop Controller, which combines the, <laughs> I know, which, <laughs> which combines the valve approximation function with the Bellerhadek approximation function uh, with a not at t equals t intersection, which we found previously. The following 
is the input of the oxidizer for utilizing Prometheus Open Loop Controller, or POLC, for every different fuel that we simulated. And these are the, the thrust simulations that we have. As you can see, all of the oxidizer to fuel ratio shifts were eliminated during the entire operation. However, we did experience a slight decrease in thrust. Uh, for this, we went to mythology and constructed the inverse of our Prometheus controller or our Epimetheus open loop controller. For, <laughs> we derived a new inverse Belaradek configuration, which is the inverse of the Belaradek, which was used for the EOLC case, resulting in the following uh, inputs of the, um, uh, of the oxidizer mass flow rate, uh, which are increasing, as we can see. And these result in the following thrust uh, values for each fuel. We can see that we did uh, achieve a thrust increase. However, we have some uh, we have worse OF shifts than we had before. So, concluding from this, we can say that the POLC controller is actually very useful at eliminating the OF shifts of during operation. It does decrease the efficiency by a maximum of 61.9 percent. However. The efficiency losses have a positive correlation with our flux exponent of the fuel. So the more it increases, the more decreases we have. Um, it is also very useful if thrust is not a big issue and the main goal is to eliminate every uh, eliminate the effects of the fuel regression. The EOLC, on the other hand, does worsen the OF ratios, uh, but does have a theoretical maximum increase of 292.6%. This is because of some uh, some uh, missing constraints, which are going to be fixed in the future and discussed in the future work. The flux exponent uh, it has a positive correlation with the increase in uh, efficiency with this one, and it's good for increasing thrust overall without caring much for the OF shifts. And both of these controllers work well for engines with various burn times, so it's not going to suddenly turn off the engine, because we had previous experience with that simulation. The future work for this thesis concludes uh, Constraining the thrust simulations to be more realistic, this would include modeling a saturation point for the valve, which would not allow us to have infinitely increasing oxidizer values. Um, we're also currently working on a manuscript uh, that we're preparing to publish this research, as it was not done before. Um, future entails designing actual closed loop, so a feedback loop system, probably utilizing model reference adaptive control, which will be necessary if this were to use on an actual hybrid rocket as it has to take <laughs> external disturbances into consideration. Do actual hybrid rockets have feedback? No. At all? No. Uh, and uh, for that... How about if they're going up? Right. Because the, the oxygen in the air is going to change. So they yeah, there's a lot of disturbances. that so, so we want to take those into account. That's why we want to do closed loop control work in the future. And after the finalization of every uh, addition, we're going to test all of the controllers mentioned above on an actual static stand in order to compare the theoretical results with the actual results of different fuels, control versus no control. In my acknowledgments, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Haracha for, uh, for everything, essentially, <laughs> being the support throughout this very, very tiring journey, uh, as well. As well as most of my friends and alumni who are part of all of this, and my parents. So thank everybody so much. I wouldn't be here without any of you. Thank you. Okay, one thing that uh, can help you solve the closed loop control is to have some sensors or detectors in the exhaust mm -hmm. terminates, whether it's oxidizer rich or, or not, whether you have overflow of oxidizer or mm -hmm. not. Um, also, have you uh, researched other engines, for example, constant burn surface engines? Yes. There are some. There is, it's all actually, currently, the problem with hybrid, uh, f with the OF ratio is solved by creating a fuel grain, just like I showed you with a star pattern, with a pattern that has constant area throughout its operation. So that's how they're solving it. But however, my approach was to have a more easily manufacturable cylindrical burn surface that would be controlled from an external controller, essentially. Okay. So I'm trying to make the problem uh, solvable for many different cases of the fuel, as well as a simpler manufacturing process. All right. Okay. Um, yes. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so we'll, again, when we talk about the oxidizer, yeah. what is the correlation with the 
atmospheric air as, a, as an oxidizer in the whole process. Uh, so are you saying using uh, atmospheric air for combustion? Well, since, since you are in, in the atmosphere and then the density is getting changed and mm -hmm. then you are also using an, another uh, chemical as, mm -hmm. as main mm -hmm. oxidizer. Mm -hmm. So is, is, is it somehow also using atmospheric Extremely. air as, as an oxidation or process or actually just yeah actually isolated? no because no, because yes. the combustion combustion uh, combustion uh, chamber is at very high pressures uh, compared to the atmospheric pressure so essentially the the main process is going out inside and we're actually fe feeding pure oxygen uh, in our, in our <coughs> case pure liquid oxygen so the 21 percent or even lower if you're higher up is not going to yeah. have any effect on, well, on the combustion with process. The fuel you are using, uh -huh. pure liquid oxygen wouldn't work. You have to have a different kind of oxygen. Well, yes, uh, I mean, I just said an example. Which, which also, like, we can have NO2 and CO2. Inside, et cetera. So, HPTB and, uh, yes. and uh, aluminum would. Would require would require a different yeah yeah, yeah so. obviously so <laughs> we, this was a general approach yeah. so we don't focus yeah. on what oxidizer is being used this was just to make sure that it's it's viable and okay. it looks like it might be. <laughs> yeah. cool. yes. I have okay. not not a technical question just mm -hmm. I'm curious to learn from like how you come up with this idea or like was it suggested with somebody what. How you come up that this should be your capstone oh, subject? This has been my dream since I was six. Me and me and my dad <laughs> was behind there. We always watched uh, every possible thing, starting with the, with you know the shuttle, shuttle launches, uh, documentaries about space. We had a telescope. I've, I've been watching at the, uh, the stars since I was five, and ever and since I wanted to be in this field. Is, uh, like I didn't fully understood, honestly, like every detail. Well, so you can be but, sure. uh, but something like, <coughs> how are you sure? Why it is? Uh, I, I'm I'm convinced that this is something new that you're doing. Like why, no one else? Like having this many research institutes mm -hmm, all mm -hmm. over the world conducting many different types of research, especially for the rocket science, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, haven't done any similar kind of research. And well, I mean, uh, yeah. What's the it was interesting for me too, and I, 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 I figured that I wanted to do something with rocketry. This wasn't the first thing that came to mind. But then uh, the hybrid rocket engines were actually first theorized and uh, made possible in the, in the early 1970s during the space race, and were quickly abandoned because of the effects of the regression, uh, because they have a much stronger liquid rocket engine, and the, the developers of those have enough funds to make the complex ones work. Uh, my guess is that it was just abandoned starting then because I haven't found anything that has to do with controlling the regression rates or controlling the uh, having any sort of a controller in, in, in the hybrid okay. rocket engine. Thank you. Thank you. The first hybrids flew in 1930s. Yeah, yeah, that, that, <laughs> I, I, it's a bit late. I mean, like, they, they academically. They were complex and they were the thrust Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you.